Our three lessons this morning point us to the glory of the Lord. In the Old Testament reading, it was an assurance to Elijah, uh, pardon, to Elijah and Elisha. In the New Testament readings, the first speaks about the removal of the veil, and then the second is the traditional story of Jesus being transfigured with Elijah and Moses. First lesson, 2 Kings chapter 2. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet, if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson, 2 Corinthians 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, It is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. This is the word of God. Gospel lesson today is in St. Mark, chapter 9, starting at verse 2. This will also serve as our sermon text. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, 
it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You may remember when I was here last time, I asked several questions throughout the sermon. I won't be doing that today, but I will answer, ask one or two. Grace to you and peace from God our Father through our Savior Jesus Christ, who was and is and is to come. Dear fellow citizens of God's kingdom, as I mentioned before, the text is the well-known lesson of the Sermon on the Mount. I'm sorry, it's not the Sermon on the Mount, from Mount Transfiguration. And I won't ask you where the Sermon on the Mount is. You know, one of the hardships of life is parting. The child that goes off having matured, attained adulthood, the grandchildren who leave, and even death. The separation from a loved one is hard. While she was still alive, we would, went, we would go and visit my mother, who was in an assisted living home, living, uh, home and um, we would be there maybe three minutes. And she said, I'm so happy you're here, but I'm about to cry, because I know you're going to be leaving. Parting can be quite sorrowful. And if you noticed in our Old Testament reading, there was quite an exposition on the departing of Elijah from Elisha. It was told him three times. He said, I know. Please be quiet. But the only way to really look on someone who is parting is to look at their brightness. I mean, true brightness. You see, when Elisha received the cloak, he then was given a vision, not a vision, a reality of the chariot on fire, the horses on fire. And what did he call out? Father, Father. And Elijah was taken up into the heavens. And so it is that he was given a very glorious farewell. And my point this morning is that you get ready. Because you're going to be given a glorious farewell. The one in which was also revealed to Peter, James, and John. They were brought up to this mountain, and there they saw before them transfigured Jesus, Elijah, and Moses. And Peter immediately said, it's good that we're here. We're going to build three tents so we can stay here. Now the Bible also mentions he said this a little bit out of fear. But there they were. They saw these individuals in glory, in brightness. And so it was that this was to be a foretaste of what would be theirs and what would be every Christian's throughout the world, this glory. It was a glory that we really can't comprehend. You see, glory, we know that word, we use that word, but it's hard to put in here. 
Glory is one being in the presence of God. That's true glory. Glory is being without sin. In other words, holiness. And so it is that we today are to look up and look to the glory that is prepared for us. You see, Jesus had glory, but he left it behind. He came down to earth to earn this glory for us. For the glory that was set before him, he despised the cross and the shame of death. He earned this glory. He had set aside his own in order to make us available to go into God's presence. Now, I think you can agree with me, one of the things that we want to be careful with is that glory is given, but the glory we have today is going to be on a different note. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> when Isaiah was given a glimpse of God's glory in Isaiah chapter 6, he saw the magnitude of the majesty of God and remember all the angels and what did he say? He cried out, I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips and I live among people of unclean lips. He didn't want to be associated with that glory because of his sin. Or remember again when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and he was radiant and the people were scared and he had to put a veil over his face. Even Peter, after one of the Lord's miracles, said to Jesus, Lord, you have to get away from me for I am a sinner. And that's the aspect we want to remember about ourselves. And that's the aspect we will be looking at in the Lenten season. But that is not something that controls us. It is something that we have to look past, to look to the glory. And Jesus helps us with that when he said to his disciples, don't tell anyone about this until after my death. And he came than to bring his body into humiliation, into subjugation to all sin. This glory was a foretaste of what the disciples were going to be going through. He did tell them that his future life was going to be bad. He said this. It's also in Mark. He then began to teach them that the, gospel, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. You know the walk that Jesus took from this point on. There was that human body holding the divine, but yet ending up with welts on his back. Blood dripping down from the cross onto the ground. The blasphemy of those who set him up on trial three times. Twice in the evening in front of the Sanhedrin and then in front of Pilate. This was a body in a human who had to control anger when he was being rejected. You be the son of God, come down from the cross, they yelled. And so there's going to be event after event in the last weeks of his life which shows us how he conquered sin and how he gives us the opportunity to look up to brightness. Now, 
one of the things that the three disciples saw were the human transformed into the glory. They saw what would eventually be theirs. They no longer saw Moses or Elijah with frail and old bodies, fingers full of arthritis, knees that maybe should be transplanted, eyes that had grown dim. Their bodies were transfigured. And that's what you and I are looking for. You see, we still have to go through this life of sorrow, this life of separation. And we're going to have to do it ourselves. For the most part, we have to face earth, the devil's afflictions. See, no one else, if you got that flu, can get well for you. A child that is going through some severe affliction, you can be there to comfort, but the child has to go through it alone. They say that there's nothing quite as painful as the separation of a parent from a child either because of unbelief or because of death. But here, look for a glorious farewell. For in your faith, you have the ability to identify to people this glory. And one of the things, let me mention to you, to think ahead to your deathbed. How are you going to handle that? There's going to be all kinds of friends and relatives coming to comfort, but maybe think about comforting them. Maybe think about ministering to their souls even though your body is starting to go and help them by talking about this glory. Several years ago, my wife and I were privileged to be in the city of Rome and in the city, we took a tour of the catacombs. And I don't know if you know what the catacombs are. It's underground burial vaults. Christians were buried in them by the tens of thousands. And this took place over a series of years. And these vaults, as I call them, were nothing more than kind of shelves, I think there were three on each level. And they would go along and go along. And there were three stories of them. And the Christians would be placed in that shelf and it would be sealed completely. No name. No date when they were born and when they died. But they were dressed in their finest because they all died thinking, tomorrow is my resurrection. Tomorrow is my glory. And the things from earth were not carried on before them. In fact, there were murals throughout these three miles of catacombs. And by the way, there are more miles than that. That's just the section we were in. But the, all the murals pictured humans who were children. All the disciples were pictured as children. Jesus was pictured as children. So here's my one question. Why would they do that? Why would they picture humans as children? What do you think? Someone want to guess? You're looking at me good. <laughs> One of the answers from Thursday night was excellent. She said, because of their innocence and their new life. 
the vitality of life. And so it is that you and I are to look forward to our glorious farewell and share it with others, especially in maybe the last day or weeks, I mean uh, minutes of our life. But now, one of the other things that has to be noticed is that there were the three of them above and three below. There was companionship. They were together. There weren't all kinds of questions. There wasn't all kinds of wonderment. There wasn't all kinds of doubt. They were together. And so one of the things about our glorious farewell is that we are together with Jesus, through faith together with the Heavenly Father. How do we stay together? How do we keep him as our constant companion? Well, God spoke from heaven. And here's my second question. What did he say to those three? Don't be shy. Want to try it? This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Great. I love him. Now you listen to him. You stay connected to him and you're going to have constant companionship. And that is one of the reasons that we have this Lenten season. In the devotions that come, each week you see the things that he done, has, has done for us. We stay connected because of his suffering, and we stay connected because God says, this is my son. I'm going to hold you next to him. And by the way, just as a review, the Wednesdays or the weeks of Lent are about his suffering and the Sundays are about his victories during Lent. Anyway, now the glorious farewell. You're going to go on with life. You're going to have challenges each day. Anger is going to be a wedge. A broken friendship is going to be a hurt. A fall that breaks a wrist, maybe in our future. Whatever it is, Satan and the world, our sinful flesh, has got in mind a program to distract us, to doubt us about the companionship of the Lord. And dear friends, God's going to use those things. One of them is so that we don't fall in love with the things of this world. That because of it, I mean, because of affliction, we look up and we look past it. We let go. There's a glorious farewell in store for you. And remember, he's going to change your vile body and fashion it like unto his, sorry, third question, glorious body. And now think about that. The glorious body that Jesus had. Ponder it when you get to Easter. Look up. Be proud in faith and humble in faith. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.